Wait till okay, I say well, this is All right, live. Good. All right, I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and uh, this is Dr. Dale Bredesen. I'm the director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Medicine, and Dale is the founding president and the CEO of the Buck Institute uh, for Research on Aging, looking at Alzheimer's. He's one of the world's leading Alzheimer's researchers. And uh, we just finished Grand Rounds here at Cleveland Clinic, and we're going to be uh, doing a little Q&A on this radical new approach to rethinking the brain and rethinking Alzheimer's and showing that actually we may actually have a way to actually reverse Alzheimer's. Especially early on. That's so so in, your, in your grand rounds, you really got into this concept that the, the brain is very plastic, that it can change, that it can shift, that it actually can adapt to its environment for good or for bad, and that there's insults that happen that cause it to go down a path of degeneration, but there's also inputs that can happen that can actually reverse that process. And you, you presented some amazing cases of patients who actually had early dementia that you implemented a whole series of interventions based on right. functional medicine principles of treating right. the system, not the symptoms, and you right. saw radical changes in recovery. And so um, how, many, how many patients have you run through this, this protocol? So there have now been over 100 have come through. Over 100 patients. And what, what percent of those patients have actually uh, shown improvement or had reversal? Right, the majority of them. So we published the first 10, and then the first 10, nine of them improved, and one who was very late did not. We now recognize several different types of Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. and they respond differently. So some are easier to treat than others, and again, earlier better. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ones that have specific types or are very late um, uh, are more difficult. Out of the over 100 now, a number of them are too early to tell. And this takes typically three to six months to see a big effect. Um, and so some of these are too early to tell, but the majority continue to improve. So what are the things that you're finding are, are really going on at the causative level? Right. And then what are the kinds of things we'll get into? What are the things that actually work on the therapeutic level? Right. So on the causative level, I mean, in, in, as you mentioned, you know, this is all about functional medicine, and this is, has its roots in biochemistry. So you can look very clearly at this plasticity balance. You can look at what actually happens to APP itself, the uh, amyloid precursor protein, and there are many things that feed into this, and they include um, everything from uh, inflammation, as you've s uh, spoken about many times, um, NF-kappa B activation in particular mm -hmm. activates both the beta and gamma secretase that cleave the APP to give you the, quote, four bad guys, the ones that are on the side of the pulling back. So, so NF-kappa B is like an inflammatory transcription it's factor. That absolutely. So you, when you have that inflammation going on, you are actually putting yourself on the wrong side of the APP plasticity balance. And then when you can improve that inflammation, you're putting yourself on the right side. So what we find is that the type one patients, inflammation seems to be the major driver for this, and we want to address that. But of course, we want to understand not just how to improve the inflammation, but to understand what's causing the inflammation to begin right. with. Is it external? So what are you finding in terms of Alzheimer's that's driving some of this inflammation? Because you don't right. want to just take steroids or take an anti-inflammatory, which haven't really been shown to exactly. be effective. So. so you don't want to try to just get rid of it without knowing what's causing it. And so the common things we're, causing, uh, we're seeing is that, in fact, some of it's external, some of it's internal. The internal drivers are what you've talked about a lot, glycotoxicity. So we call this type 1.5 mm -hmm. because people who have, and the reason for that is because they've got both the inflammation and the atrophic part. Mm -hmm. So in fact, if you withdraw trophic support from neurons, what do they do? They start making amyloid. Uh -huh. So it's a downsizer. It's a programmatic downsizer. Very interesting. So you mean so sugar and so you and so, insulin resistance. Right. So you now, if you now, the insulin resistance gives you the atrophic part, mm -hmm. and the glycated proteins cause the inflammation that gives you the type one part. So you mm. get this combination of type one and type two, which is why we call it type one point five. So sugar is a big cause, and I think you know, just as you've pointed out many times, the sugar in our diets is giving us a lot of our illness. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, anything that uh, trans fats that also do you know inflammatory processes, and then external in inflammogens. So we're finding a number of people who have exposure to mycotoxins. Um, this is turning out to be a relatively common cause of the underlying problem and, and a big problem mold. because you've got a mold. Um, and then as, as Dr. Shoemaker has shown, it's 30 different things in the soup that we're all breathing. It's not just the mycotoxins, it's the fragments, it's the mycobacteria, it's the inflammogens, it's the volatile organic compounds, yeah. on and on and on. We live um, in a toxic we sea. We live in a toxic <laughs> sea, that's absolutely right. And so you need to know what people, does that really affect? So we want to mm. check people's HLA-DRDQs to find 
find out, are you in the group that is sensitive, as Shoemaker has shown over the years? Yeah. Um, and interestingly, almost all the ones who have that type are in the dreaded or in the highly biotoxin sensitive group. So it really fits very much with his model. And then of course, as you know, there's so a the lot. So in the inhalation Alzheimer's you were talking about, which is really based on these inflammatory response, systemic inflammatory response. Exactly. And so it seems that you've got both the inflammatory response, where this is really about your response to it, but then others who don't have a dramatic response, but they therefore have more exposure to the toxin itself. And depending on whether you've got more in inflammatory part, which gives you more of a type 1 look or more of a toxic response which gives you mm -hmm. more of a type 3 look mm -hmm. these are two different types of patients yeah. depending and again it's so a little what you're like saying basically is just because you say someone has Alzheimer's doesn't mean you know what's causing it exactly and it doesn't really help you figure out what to do about it right. unless you right. drill down into the sort of details of what right. the issues are that are creating imbalances right that's Whether exactly it's toxins right. or it's diet right. or various factors, right. mold. Right. So this is why I was saying that you shouldn't put a period after Alzheimer's disease. You should mm -hmm. say Alzheimer's disease due to blank, 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 you know, what are all the things that contribute? And that's what we've been interested in, to find all the contributors and then to address each of them. Again, very much like a functional medicine approach. So you much. mentioned toxic. And are you finding these patients have heavy metals or other exposure to toxins? Yeah. How do you deal with that? So we absolutely are. So we find, uh, as I mentioned, the mycotoxins and the volatile organic compounds and things like that. And then others, yes. And we, interestingly, we've had a number of of people who will come in have PET scans, classic for Alzheimer's disease, classic presentations for Alzheimer's disease, um, evaluation elsewhere that says, okay, you have Alzheimer's disease, nothing we can do about it. But when we look more carefully, mm -hmm. um, we find just what your 2007 book suggested, that some of these people do indeed have high mercury levels. Now, yeah. the majority do not. But some, it is absolutely yeah. a critical contributor. Yeah. And then we've been typically treating them um, with the kind of classic uh, cube sort of approach with uh, you know, increasing glutathione and things like that. Mm -hmm. Helping the body and detoxify, yeah. Helping the body detoxify. And as you know, it takes a number of months. But these people you know, clearly improve. And we look at also you know, how much is inorganic, how much is organic, that sort of thing. So you're finding insults so, like glycotoxicity, right. like mold, like yeah. heavy metals. Any others that are that are jumping out as, as causative factors? Yeah, so and again, uh, people who um, are you know long-term uh, trophic withdrawal, people who are walking around with low vitamin D, low vitamin B12s. So um, not, maybe not be what's causing it, maybe what you're missing. Like it may be not a, an inciting factor, but like a... But it's a contributing a factor. So that's where the type 2 comes in. So if you simply, again, you take the cells, you, you withdraw their trophic support, mm -hmm. they will begin to make amyloid yeah. as part of a downsizing. Mm -hmm. So there are toxic insults, there are inflammatory insults, mm -hmm. but there are also trophic withdrawals yeah. that contribute directly to this. And you need to the identify... About methylation defects. Those. Methylation defects, common. As you know, yeah. high homocysteine, very commonly associated low with all B12, folate. Low B12s, low folates, these are all contributors. And what else? Vitamin D, you're talking about that. and Vitamin D, um, absolutely. Zinc and um, copper. So and zinc and copper. And one of the things that we've looked at is the copper-zinc ratio. And of course, uh, Dr. George Brewer from Michigan has spent his career mm -hmm. looking at this ratio of copper to zinc and showing that high copper, low zinc is often associated with dementia. This was published by others as well. And that correcting that can be helpful in a number of people. And how are you correcting that? Typically, we use uh, the Brewer protocol, which is typically you know zinc picolinate, mm -hmm. a small amount of manganese as well, um, some vitamin B6, mm -hmm. um, uh, and acetylcysteine. Mm -hmm. uh, so, a pretty typical protocol for reduction of the copper, increasing of the zinc. Is and that of course, actually uh, high dose of ascorbate? Yeah, you know, sort of interesting. You know, the 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 whole concept of dementia is that a metabolic encephalopathy right. is sort of a it's a common pathway for many different brain insults, whether it's autism or right. Alzheimer's. And I often see the same pathologies at either ends of the spectrum. Right. And, uh, and in fact, even in, in uh, psychiatric illnesses, Carl Pfeiffer looked at this years ago, looking at these th same things of copper zinc ratios and all these various yeah. nutri nutri deficiencies. And I think the problem has been that everybody wanted one thing. And so, in fact, as you know now, there are many different microorganisms associated mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease, especially mm -hmm. in biofilms. So everything from P. gingivalis to HSV1 mm -hmm. to spirochetes, Borrelia burgdorferi, you can go on and on and on, all of mm -hmm. these pathogens that are associated. And each time they say, well, this is the cause of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, we're breaking Co uh, Koch's postulates here. Yeah. We're saying it's not just one thing. thing right. There are many different things that you can get in your yeah. brain. So if you've got a problem with your oral 
oral brain barrier, or if you've got a nasal issue and you've mm -hmm. got chronic inflammation through yeah. that. And, and interestingly, for years, people have said Alzheimer's has something to do with the nose because mm -hmm. it's the rhinencephalon. You look at the pathways, yeah. it's clearly nasally related. That's been written mm -hmm. about for years. Interesting. And yet it's not clear what's causing it. Well, I think now we're starting to see this, and that's one of the reasons for IAD. So these people are being exposed to chronic infl inflammation that's coming in through the nose. Yeah. And then, of course, gut is another one. Um, and obviously you've written about How does the gut play a role so in the brain dementia? The, the gut is, is playing a huge role. And we see a number of these people have very clearly leaky guts, mm -hmm. you know, LPS, mm -hmm. antibodies. Mm -hmm. um, they've got uh, HSCRPs. And some of them, interestingly, not all. Mm -hmm. um, they've often got sens uh, sensitization. Um, to uh, gluten, mm -hmm. um, some to other grains and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So again, we try to get them on more of a fat diet, just the sort of things that you've recommended yeah. over the years. It's fascinating. I just Good. recall a patient I had, one of the first patients I had, you know, probably 12, 15 years ago, who had early dementia. And mm -hmm. uh, we just did a functional medicine approach to around. He had ApoE4 homozygous. He had me methylation SNPs, MTHFR homozygous. He had years of irritable bowel and high levels of inflammation in his gut, not just sort of irritable bowel, but kind of crossing over to inflammatory bowel. He had lived in Pittsburgh, had very high levels of mercury, right. and had mouthful of fillings. And we didn't, and he had very high levels of homocysteine and methylmalonic acid. And we basically addressed all these factors. And his brain recovered. And it was sort of a shock to me. <laughs> and I called the neurologist, like, how does this happen? How do you see right. people's scans improve and their Neurocognitive testing improves, and them objectively get better and subjectively get better. Yeah. It's sort of a shock. Yeah, I mean, this, this is a major paradigm shift, right? Absolutely, and I think we have to get rid of a lot of our old ideas that this is untreatable, that there's only one thing that's going to ultimately cause this. You know, that we we give a pill for it. Mm -hmm. um, this is something where there are multi factors. We need to understand all of them, and then mm -hmm. we need to address all of them. Mm -hmm. One of the things that terrified me uh, in your talk <laughs> <laughs> was when you mentioned that statins seem to, yeah. by a, a very clear mechanism, promote a type of amyloid process that leads to dementia. Right. Can you kind of go into that and explain what we're doing with this? And, yeah. and of course, uh, for some people, you know, statins uh, have been uh, presumably helpful, although I think you know, more and more people are looking for alternative ways to improve the, the lipid profile. Um, so what we found, we, we screened every FDA-approved drug for its effect on this plasticity balance, where we measure this biochemically by the ratio of APP cleavages to the memory peptides or the forgetting peptides, essentially, as we think about mm -hmm. them. And interestingly, the one out of all the FDA-approved drugs that gives you this, uh, the dementogen uh, uh, signature was statins. And interestingly, the one that did it the most was the statin that had already had to be taken off the market because it had so many side effects. Which so, uh, cerebrostatin, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, and that would gave them muscle problems and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So, um, so our, yeah, so our concern, and as you know, it's well is it, documented. Is it because of the effect on the mitochondria? This was a totally different effect, though. This was this an is amyloid a different effect. effect. This is an effect on the cleavage of APP, not even specifically on amyloid, but on the way the APP, the amyloid precursor protein, gets cleaved, especially to make one fragment, which is called C31, which is one that induces programmed cell death. So basically you're saying statins affect APP in a way that leads to programmed cell death and sort of accelerating dementia. That's a concern. And as you know, many people who take statins will say, oh yeah, absolutely, should, it affects my memory. Should we be screening Others. people for APOE4 who are taking statins? We don't know whether it's worse in APOE4, mm -hmm. but I think you're, you're right that we want to be sure that these people need the statins and we want to look at alternative ways before we ever introduce the statins. So in your paper, Reversing um, Cognitive Decline, right. um, you talked about different kinds of diets and ketogenic diets and, and right. fat in the brain. Can you right. kind of go into that a little bit? Because on the one hand, we're talking about you know, statins causing it and right. low-fat diets may be contributing. And can you kind right. of explain well, what, of you're, course, what you're finding about that? Absolutely. And we look carefully because, as has been pointed out repeatedly by, by you, by David Perlmutter, by others, uh, low cholesterol is associated with brain atrophy. So mm -hmm. the last thing we want to see is people with cholesterol, especially cholesterols below 150, are, are concerning to us. Total cholesterol. Total cholesterol, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, obviously, there are many you know, more nuanced ways to look at cholesterol, but we worry about people who are 
low fat. We worry about people who have low cholesterols. Um, and absolutely, this is a problem. So we want to get people on MCT. We want to get MCT medium chain oil, triglycerides, medium chain which triglycerides. is actually a saturated fat. Exactly. We right? want to get people to have saturated fat, and, and you know, it's been pointed out. This is heresy, right? Yeah, We're I know. Saturated fat for yeah. treating dementia. So, which organ are you going to pick? Your heart or your brain, or does it matter? Or well, the, yeah, the, the, and, and the, the hope is that you're going to do well with both, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's so, the, I mean, it sort of goes to the concept of, is there one diet that's good for your brain and one that's good for your heart and one that's good for cancer, and they're all different? So right. you have to pick your disease? Or is it really that there's one way of eating that can help support all of these uh, diseases going away? And I think the latter. I think we're going to, yeah. you know, certainly uh, you know, understanding lipid biology better is going to mm-hmm. allow us to do the right things mm-hmm. for the heart and the brain at the same time. So when you, when you so were we writing do. that paper, you mentioned ketogenic diets. What, what's right. been the thinking so, behind that? And actually the reality is, uh, although I didn't put it in the paper, we suggested that people read your book, actually, uh, on uh, the, the blood sugar solution, mm-hmm. or also read Joel Furman's book if they were interested in more of a vegetarian style. Right. Uh, and, and obviously, we're, we're getting better and better uh, yeah. with understanding. And obviously, you've got the, the new book, uh, Eat Fat, Get Thin, which you know changes even further some of the diets. I think we're getting better and better yeah. about understanding what is the best diet for the brain. And absolutely, the key to this is changing from a carbohydrate-based diet mm-hmm. and to a lipid-based diet. Yeah. That and that seems to be the best for the brain. Mm-hmm. So you know, we're here at Cleveland Clinic, and uh, we've been having conversations about research and. You know, one of the challenges that we've found is that, is that much research is just looking at one disease with one variable. Right. But now we're talking about collaborating on doing a research program that looks at maybe 100 things right. or 500 things. Right. Um, how is that changing the model? Because well, we're all, you know, the randomized controlled trial was this one variable, one yeah. outcome. And it's how does that, how do we yeah. reframe research around well, this concept? And it's fascinating to me that physicians for thousands of years have been dealing with these incredibly complex organisms, right? Mm-hmm. And then here, you know, you've got your 3.3 billion base pairs, and that's just the beginning. You know, you've mm-hmm. got your epigenome and your proteome and all this. And then they're saying, well, let's just fix one thing. It really doesn't make sense. And I think in years gone by, when we didn't have the ability to look at these 100 mm-hmm. or 500, you know, you couldn't do a, a whole genome screen. Um, then you had to do that. You didn't have any other choice. But now we're able to look at this. We're able to look at, you know, we can tell you what your hippocampal volume is percentile-wise, mm-hmm. and we can mm-hmm. tell you, you know, what you, you know, what your entire genome shows and all these sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So absolutely, when we take advantage of that, we get better diagnostics, yeah. we get better subtyping, we get better ability to make it, you know, to improve things. And that's exactly what we're seeing, especially in chronic illnesses and especially with early dementia and early pre-dementia. So what's, what's overwhelming, I'm sure, for many viewers is that how do we then take this and operationalize it? How do we, as physicians or practitioners, apply all these variables clinically, and how do we intervene with our patients to affect change? And, you know, if you're a patient or someone listening who's, who's actually concerned about getting it or has someone in their family who has it, how do you begin to kind of address this? Uh, and, and I think... Uh, if you're willing, maybe you could share a little bit about your vision about how we go about scaling this and, and making this happen. Right. So as physicians, as practitioners, we need larger data sets, unquestionably. We need a different way to practice medicine. We need more uh, interaction with Silicon Valley. We need more computational biology. We need more computational algorithms guiding us. Say, okay, given all these ratios, et cetera, you know, why should this be restricted <laughs> to derivatives on Wall Street, right? right, right. Let's make people better <laughs> using computational biology. We need a a functional medicine. We need functional medicine taught in the medical schools. When you and I came through medical school, uh, you long after I did, but when we both came through, I mean, it was, we were never taught this. You know, it was all about get that drug, find that drug. And and it was all about what it is, what's the diagnosis, instead of why it is. So we need to change all these things. And and I think a large part is going to be to be able to have algorithms where you can say, okay, what type do I have? Whether What are all the contributors to my congestive heart failure, to my Alzheimer's disease, to my Parkinson's, and to address all these things. And that is where functional medicine is going. Yeah. So to have the first center uh, here at Cleveland Clinic is going to be exciting. This is uh, hopefully a model for the rest of the world. It's great. It's very exciting to have you here, Dale. Yeah. And the great future is very bright for our brains, it seems. I hope so. <laughs> I think we're in the, things are going in the right direction. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks, thanks for joining us thanks at so Cleveland much, Clinic Mark. and look forward fantastic. to collaborating. And thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, Thank you. Uh, more to come. Thanks, Mark.